Thank you, worship team. That was amazing. It was. Yeah. For those of you who may not know who I am, my name's on the board. I'm Jay Tilly, the children's ministry director here. Normally, I'm in the wing with the kids, and we have a lot of fun there. But uh, today, I'm here with you, and I'm happy to be here. You know, last Sunday evening we met, we ultimately voted. I say ultimately, it was like two and a half hours. And, uh, you know, I had to work last evening because I did inventory. And, you know, I'm required to be there for that. But I took a lunch. I thought, well, we'll just go over. We'll have, we'll have a business meeting. I'll get back. I was like a three-hour lunch. It's, it's, good to be, it's good to be a manager. And you can have as long lunch as you want. So nobody even questioned me. But... Uh, you know, God called us to have that meeting. We're leading. I mean, he's leading. We're following to expand the worship facility on this property. It's an exciting time to be a part of the congregation. I believe hope's been chosen by God to take this path. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I'm not alone. You know, we live in a place where there's great lostness, there's great spiritual darkness, and we are a light. The light of our God shines in us, shines on us, shines through us. God has blessed us spiritually, obviously, and financially, as we heard our pastor tell us about the money given to missions. We've prayed, we've seen, we've experienced the call of God, and I think, I believe, I am convinced God wants us to be a brighter light. Other places of worship around us are diminishing. We all know this. We were reminded of this in the business meeting. But you know what? We're not. We're growing. That very aspect of this church, that we're growing, gives us more responsibility. God's not happy that churches diminish. And we shouldn't be either. That's not what I'm saying. We should be praying for these churches. But the growth that we have is evidence to me that God is moving us and moving in this direction. And it's not just this year. Things have been happening for years here at Hope. For the last five and a half years that I've been here, but also I've pastored here in this area for the last 15 years. And I've seen God bless Hope during that time. Some of the newer folks may not be aware of this, but things have been happening here for a long time. You know, when I arrived on the scene, the very next, like six months later, we entered COVID. And we were also taken aback by COVID. And there were so many naysayers. This is going to be the end of the church in America. Far from ending us, COVID set us up for greater things. You know, as a staff, we sat down when COVID struck and immediately began reimagining what worship could be. And I think, maybe it's just me, but that the pandemic set us free from all the forms and traditions that build up over time. Even in 20 years, there were forms and traditions, and we had to look outside that. And Neil's been dreaming for new ideas and means to serve the Lord in our community and leading us. And I think through COVID, we gained momentum. God brought us and prepared us to be healthy, to have a greater ministry. So COVID, rather than doing us in, was a tool in God's hands to bring us to where we are today. And that's what God teaches us. I believe this is another evidence God has chosen us. We've been blessed. We've been prepared. We've been led. And uh, when Pastor Neil asked me to speak, I meditated and I began to think, because I don't speak a lot. I've been in ministry for 36 years, but it's been a couple of years since I've actually prepared and delivered this kind of a sermon. I mean, I do something every week, but you wouldn't probably want me to do what I do in Kids Connect. <laughs> so, but I thought God brought a specific passage to my mind, and I would like to share it with you this morning. 1 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 10. We're going to look especially at verses 9 and 10. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Just to provide a little context to these verses, the book of 1 Peter was written by Peter from beginning to end to point out that God's people, God's Christ followers are different. Different from the world. Different from people who don't know the Lord. The one true God. We have a different hope than everyone else. We have a different joy. We have a different salvation. Our salvation is by grace. It's not us, it's Him. Most people believe you have to earn your salvation. But we're different. We have a different attitude. We have a different motivation. We have a different love. We're different. And Peter's whole message is telling us, you're different. Be different. He points out all the ways we're different, and this text is no different. And in these verses, especially in verse 9, we're given four blessings that we have that make us more different than you can possibly imagine. And these four blessings are why I'm excited to be here in this place, in this time. Now, we talk about blessings. I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. You see, there are many people today who totally miss the boat and the Bible when it comes to understanding what it means to be blessed. You know, often people have ideas of philosophies about the Christian faith that can be summed up in this phrase, although they would never say it out loud. But this is the way they act. Their philosophy is, God is there to serve our happiness. Not the other way around. You know, a popular pastor, I won't name, recently wrote, and I read these words, he says, and I quote, I just want to encourage every one of us to realize that when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we are happy. The thing that gives him the greatest joy is when we are happy. I won't share the name behind that message. I'm not here to tear down people or other ministries. But all I can say to that is, wow. You know, what a false impression of God and what a false impression of blessing. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. And he doesn't need for me to be happy. God is sufficient in himself. God's not our genie in the bottle. We don't come to him because we want something. He wants us to be holy but he wants us to be happy, but he wants more. Happiness is temporary. And in this life, if you've lived long enough, you know it's fleeting. It comes, it goes. I have happy days, and I have days that are not so happy. 
God doesn't want that for me because happiness, if you settle for happiness, you're settling for less than what God wants. God wants us to be righteous, to be holy, to have eternal life, to experience a joy much deeper than any happiness that is abiding and that is eternal. I guess I think to be happy is just not enough. And I don't think God wants that. Something temporary in the here and now. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most miserable, the most to be pitied. So is it to say God doesn't bless Christians here in the here and now? He does. He blesses his children with material blessings. He blesses his children with happiness. But not always. Think back through your life. And for the last 2,000 years, when many believers have been poor, many have been persecuted, did God let them down? I don't think so. Peter's emphasizing that the greatest blessings of being a Christ follower are spiritual in nature. That's what we need to see. These blessings, by the way, connect to where we are right now as a church, and I think these blessings are the reason why I am so excited to see our church double in size, the building, that is, because the church is not the building, it's the people. Peter shares four great blessings, and I'll go through these quickly. The first is that we're a chosen people. You see that in verse 9. Now, this word people is a flexible one in the Greek language. It has been variously translated people or generation or family. You know, in our congregation, we pride ourselves on being multi-generational, and we are. In this passage, most theologians see this word as a reference to a family. We are a chosen family. Now, Psalm 74, 78, 4 says this, We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation. And even though there was no church then, there was Israel, the truth is the same. We are a group of people made up of seniors, like myself, those, well, I may be more middle-aged, I don't know. It's hard to say. Middle-aged would be hard to say, though. I'm 62. I don't think I'm going to make 124. At any rate, I'm going to see myself that way a little bit longer. But then we have those who are truly middle-aged, you know. Then we have those who are parent age, 20s, 30s. Of course, I'm a parent. That's different. Uh, and then we have the teenagers, and then we have the kids. We're multi-generational, and we're constantly changing because the young ones come in, The old ones go to heaven. The church never ends. We're this kind of a family. Just like every family has kids and moms and dads and grandparents and great-grandparents, that's the way the church exists. The church is the same, except the church family is better. In fact, for many Christians, the church has been their family. And this is such a great blessing. You see, families are the basic building block of society, and I think that's what God designed. And every family is is a great family, but the church, Peter is saying, is blessed as a chosen family. He chose us to be one family. Don't skate by this. Somebody might say, oh, family, so what? But we are one family. We are God's family, and God is our great heavenly Father. He loves all of us. He loves me. He loves you. Every age, every race, every language, although there's another point later that will cover that. He made us the greatest family of all time. To me, that's an incredible blessing. My brothers, my sisters, as we move forward into an unknown, uncertain future, especially the next year or so, we do it as a family. That's important, and that's a blessing. The second blessing he mentions here is that we are a royal priesthood. Way back in the Old Testament, God's people, Israel, could not approach God. They had to go through a priest. The priest would represent God to the people. The priest would speak to God, to the people, for God. 
You know, in the very beginning, the children of Israel did not have a king. They were intended by God to be a theocracy. And for hundreds of years, they, were not, they had no human king because God was their king. They rejected that, and it was not a good choice. But God intended that Israel function as a theocracy, and he does the same for the church. To be a Christian, we are a royal priesthood. That means we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Everyone around you who believes in Christ are princes and princesses of the kingdom. It's a deep blessing. We're children of the king. We don't pray through a priest or to a priest. We come directly to God. Think about what that means. If you have a problem... You can share it with me. I can't solve that problem. I can pray with you. But you come to God directly, and God can do anything. That's a blessing. You and I and every other believer are equals at the foot of the cross. That's never happened in history until the church. What a blessing. But there's a huge responsibility. It's built into the very term royal priesthood. Just as the priest in Israel represented God to the people and spoke God's message, we represent God to the world and speak God's message. We are God's kingdom representatives here on the earth. And in fact, where God's people are, there is the manifestation of God's kingdom on earth. We talk about bringing people into the kingdom and building the kingdom and expanding the kingdom. What are we talking about? We're talking about bringing people to Christ. We're here speaking on God's behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says it this way. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We're blessed to be children. We're blessed to be ambassadors of the kingdom. We have an obligation, though. It's an equal blessing. It's a blessed obligation to call everyone around us back to God. That ties directly to what we're doing. But the third blessing is that we're a holy nation. This blessing was described by Peter, who himself was an Israelite, a Jew. And he was imposing upon the church his understanding of the nation of Israel. He's saying, just as Israel was a nation, the church is a nation, a holy nation. So a nation made, what is a nation made up of? A nation is made up of citizens. There are some citizens who are natural. They're born into that country. There are some who are unnatural, or rather they're naturalized. They come in through a process. My father, who, you know, we all know who died last March, uh, he was a dual citizen. He was a citizen of India and a citizen of the United States. He had a dual citizenship. My citizenship is of the United States because I was born here. And yet... I have another citizenship that's even higher and greater and more blessed. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. The church is made up of citizens and in this sense functions as a nation. And we're born into this nation through the new birth. We're all naturalized citizens of heaven. Revelation 7.9 says it this way. He says, God's people in heaven are a great crowd of every nation, tribe, and people in language. Now, we're separate nations on earth, but in the church, we're one nation. We're one nation. Think about that. We're not white and black. We're not North American and South American. We're not African and European we're the church. We're the church. We're united. And God says we're holy. We're not holy because we're perfect. We're holy because God washed us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And he made us holy without blemish or spot and perfect. And look around. We don't look perfect, but God sees us as perfect because that's what we will be. One day, we will be perfect. We're on that road because we belong to him. We're citizens of heaven, a holy nation. Fourth blessing, verse 9, is that we're God's own special people. 
We're family. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. And we belong to God as his special people. A prized possession. The church belongs to God. We're in his care. We're under his control. We go where he leads. And he blesses us when we follow him. And he protects us as we follow him. We're priceless to God. We're chosen. God loves us. Not only does God lead us, but he never forsakes us. He doesn't lead us somewhere and leave us there. He stays with us. He's there the entire way. These are four spiritual blessings. All these blessings are ours, no matter what else. If we don't have any money, that's okay. This is good right here. If we're not happy, and we're not always happy, we still have these. Nothing can take these blessings away from us. However, with great blessings comes responsibility. There are many distractions to the church today, and I don't know all the different things that distract people, but I do know that many churches seem to have lost their way. They seem not to know why they're here, why they exist. As I was preparing for this message, um, I was looking at mission statements or vision statements because they, they're somewhat confusing to me. I can't tell the difference. On the Internet, from churches around the country, I got to this point, I'm thinking, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. And I read, I kid you not, a mission statement from a church that I will not share. Their mission, they said, was to proclaim God's glory by being the best coffee shop in the city. Maybe. But somehow, I think God's mission is a little more specific. I think it's a little bit more pinpoint. Our duty, our responsibility, our purpose is not something we create. It's not something we discover. It's not something that we define or invent. It's already here. Now, there are different ways to follow that path. I agree with you there. And maybe God called them to do that through a coffee shop, but they didn't say that. Peter writes in verse 9 that you may proclaim or declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And I prefer the translation marvelous light. This is given by the apostles as the purpose for the blessings. We are not blessed just so we can be happy. We're blessed so that we can proclaim, so that we can declare the praises of him who called us out of, his dark, out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is given by the apostle. To proclaim aloud to the world, not, not quietly. To declare, to shout. The word is even translated in some places as celebrate. You know, Amy and I had so much fun one year when the Charlotte Hornets went through the playoffs. And that doesn't happen a lot. But coming from North Carolina, we both big Charlotte Hornet fans. And uh, for a while they moved away. We stopped pulling for them. There's no such thing as New Orleans Hornets. They were dead to us. But this year, the Charlotte Hornets, uh, were playing in the playoffs against the Miami Heat, and we went to the game. And every one of us, as we entered the door, they gave us these little towels that said, Go Charlotte or Go Hornets or something like that. And we were told by the people who handed them out, Whenever you want to cheer, just shape, spend these around the air. So we're all out there in the middle of this. And by the way, Charlotte won that game. And I'm almost certain it's because of the little towels they gave us because they lost, <laughs> now, because they lost the rest of the games in that series. But at any rate, and I should have gone to the rest of the games with my towel, then maybe they would have won. But at any rate, we were spinning, we were doing this, and I remember Amy reaching over and grabbing me, and she said, stop! And I said, what? what's wrong? We couldn't even hear each other talk, so it was more like we were yelling at each other, but I'm not going to yell it. She said, you keep hitting me in the face. <laughs> so, but we were celebrating. You know what? I lost my head over a stupid basketball game. It's easy to do. But I think that the word here, proclaim, celebrate, 
really means to lose our heads, declaring the excellencies, the virtues, the praises of God. And I hope that's the way we worship. We shouldn't be bound up in seeing this as a responsibility, though it is. We should be seeing it as a privilege. The next phrase says, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God called us out of the darkness by the proclamation of the gospel. I don't know where, where you heard the gospel first, but someone had to tell you. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was a preacher. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was your father or your mother. But you heard the message somewhere. People need to hear that message from us. God also sent his Holy Spirit to convict us. God called us out of darkness. And in this world, God is still calling people out of darkness. And he's calling through me and through you. That's why this facility was built, by the way, to call people into the marvelous light. That's why it's exciting to build bigger and prayerfully call more people. This is world is dark and we're people of the light. The contrast between darkness and light is one of the primary motives of the Bible. Scripture says in Matthew 4.16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. Because we trust Christ, we come into the light. In 2 Corinthians 4, we read in verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. That is in the creation of the earth. He said, let there be light. In the same way, God created the light that's in our hearts. He says he's shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Peter reminds us that the light is not just any light, it's marvelous light. You see, darkness is bad. To stay in spiritual darkness is tragic. It means to be lost in this life. We talk about lost people. If they don't know Christ, they're lost. But in the next life, it means to be destroyed eternally. You see, they'll be lonely now, but the Bible says they'll be alone in eternity if they don't know Jesus. To be ignorant of the truth that can set us free means you're in darkness, and darkness is bad. But the light of God is marvelous. It's an astounding, it's a wonder cause in event to come out of the darkness and into the light. I love to hear the testimonies of people about when God called them out of the darkness into the light, and God's still doing that, and God, God wants to do that right here. Verse 10, we read that once we come into the light, we who once were not a people are now a people, the people of God. We who had not obtained mercy, but we've now obtained mercy. We were all lost once. Being lost is no fun. It's not fun for me. It's not fun for any of you when you were lost. It's not fun for God either because he loves us. But we weren't part of God's family. There was no belonging outside of that. In the world, the bottom line is everyone for themselves. But we'd not obtain mercy either. Mercy, you know what mercy is? Mercy is when God doesn't give you what you deserve. Before you meet Christ, the judgment of God is over you. And upon the moment you die, that judgment falls. Mercy is when the judgment's gone. You're free, and you know that you don't ever have to face that. When we were still lost, God's righteous judgment was there. Once we were lost, now we're saved. Once we were in the darkness, now we're in the light. Maybe we should give people towels when they come into church so that we can scream and proclaim the joy that we have that God has saved us. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And you don't have to bring a towel. You don't have to take a towel to work to witness. But shouldn't we be celebrating the praises of the king? God sees the broken sinner. He's not blind to their sins. 
God sees the world as it is. He's not blind to the crimes of this world, some of which we heard from our missionary. He's not blind to the perversions of this world. But when God sees people, you know what he sees? He sees what they could be if they would come out of the darkness and into the light. We should see people that way. And we should be proclaiming, God loves people. God loves you. And that's where we come in. We can't be silent. We must celebrate and proclaim the excellencies and virtues of the one who called us from the darkness into his marvelous light. You know, we really need more space. That's true. And unless you miss this, I am strongly in support of this building program. I commit in front of you and before God to pray, to be here with my energy and with my dollars. Amy and I have been praying for weeks about what can we give, and we will. We will increase our giving to support this because it would be hypocritical otherwise but also because we're excited and God has laid that on our hearts. I hope you're excited. You know, if creating this more space doesn't lead to more people hearing the praises of the king, more people being brought out of the darkness, more people becoming princes and princesses of the kingdom, more people belonging to the greatest nation in the universe, God's nation. You know, I will regret that supporting that program because that's the reason I'm supporting it. But I think the opposite is going to be true. I think down the road we're going to be happy we made this decision and we're going to celebrate. I believe more people will hear and respond to the gospel. I believe we're going to see God at work. I believe it will be amazing. And why? Because I believe God has chosen us for this, for this time. For this place, we have been chosen. I'm looking forward to the future. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all that you've done. I want to thank you for one day calling me out of darkness into light, for shining in my life, and for still being the light that, that guides me. I'm not perfect. Far from it. But it's not about me. It's about you, and you are perfect. You are holy. You are amazing. And I love you. I pray that you would help us all to join together and to love you more and to follow you closely. In Jesus' name, amen.